Hi teachers, today we're going to talk about how to teach the Chopin Prelude in E minor. This is the fourth in his set, Opus 28. It sounds like this. And on from there. I am specifically talking about how to teach this to intermediate level students, recreational students, and not necessarily how to play this if you are an advanced professional performer. We're going to have different expectations on our intermediate students than we would if we paid money to go to a concert and hear the complete set of Chopin preludes. So just wanted to throw that out there as a little caveat. Uh, today I am looking at this in the Festival Collection Book 6. And I just recently did a review of this series, so I'll link that in the description of this video. If you haven't used this series before, I highly recommend it. This particular prelude is listed on the RCM Syllabus Level 7, and for my Illinois colleagues, this is on our AIM Level 8. So obviously, many people know this piece. This is one of the most famous ones, and I think that's partly because, in general, the Chopin preludes are well-beloved but also because this is one of the easiest Chopin pieces to actually execute on the piano. It's not easy to play amazingly beautifully, but it is one of the easiest to read and play. Uh, it's, it has that classic melancholy pull on your heartstrings romantic character to it. Um, and of course, it's obviously this beautiful right hand melody with left hand accompaniment. So in some ways that makes it a comfortable piece to play as well. So what do our students need to know and be able to do in order to play this piece? We're in E minor, not a terribly difficult key, but with a lot of accidentals. So please just make sure your students are reading their accidentals, keeping them through the whole measure, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have in that E minor key, a lot of E minor triads and other triads that belong in the key, such as A minor and then some seventh chords, particularly B7, since that's the dominant of this key, but other seventh chords as well, including some diminished sevenths and things like that. Most of them are just triad inversions, so uh, not big reaches, but there are a few octaves, particularly places like measures 19 and 20, and then we do have a couple of four note chords, uh, and the chords at the end, the, the little coda, the last two measures, are a widespread. So just make sure before assigning this piece to your student that he or she has a big enough hand to be able to do that. And one quick comment about technique in measure 17 where you have that four note chord, it's really important that the left hand align in front of the body in order to reach that because it's right up here, right in front of my Yamaha letters on my fallboard. Um, and so you're coming from this low B and you have to bring your whole arm over that chord is actually a difficult reach for me personally. I don't have any problems with octaves, but the voicing of that chord is a little bit tricky. If I try to do that and I let leave my elbow out to the left, it's gonna create this with my hand, and um, that is a recipe for injury right there. So move the entire elbow, the entire forearm behind this chord when you come up, and then gradually the forearm just travels back down the keyboard as you finish the piece. All right, so in just general triad inversions, the way that I teach them, I teach them quite young to my students. If you're using a method like Piano Adventures or Piano Safari, they include piano, sorry, they include triad inversions pretty early, around level three or so, and I want my students practicing those a lot because they happen in all of our piano repertoire, whether it's blocked or broken, whatever. So I want my students seeing those chords even if they're inverted or moved around the keyboard. So the way that I teach them is just how we do them for our AIM syllabus here in Illinois. Um, I teach them blocked first. And then broken. separately first. Note that the left hand second inversion should be using a finger two uh, and right hand first inversion should use a finger two otherwise the fingering is just one three five. 
That doesn't mean you have to always use one, three, five in your repertoire, especially as you grow older. But for my lower level students, my elementary and early intermediate students, I want them practicing their inversions with that fingering so they just get very familiar at a young age with the shape and feel of those chords and inversions. Um, and then later on, after they've mastered all their triads, we're gonna do that same process with dominant seventh chords or diminished seventh chords, etc. Okay, so I'm hopeful that my students will be able to recognize the basic chords in this, that this is just E minor to start at the beginning. You know, when you get here, it's a little bit more interesting. Nice diminished seventh there, missing the C. Ah, there's an F7. So if you want to work on theory with your student in a piece like this, certainly label the chords using pop chord symbols. I don't think that at this level trying to do a Roman numeral analysis would bear you a lot of fruit because the harmony is quite complex. And that leads me to my next point, which is that I believe Chopin wrote this basing the entire idea on movement of a half step. Certainly in the melody we have the movement between B and C. And then eventually that just moves down B flat to A. Of course, we've got some whole steps too. But then you start to realize as he's moving these chords gradually down, for instance, measure two, we've got that E, which goes to E flat. And then the F sharp on the bottom, when you hit measure three, becomes F natural. And man, this is almost like Bach. What a genius to have these three notes in the left hand, which you could cut, you could analyze as three individual lines moving in half steps and whole steps, but then also how that lines up homophonically to create the harmonic progression that he creates. Ugh, total genius. Um, I always encourage my students in Chopin to look for the interesting harmonic choices because we get so caught up in the beautiful melodies. And yes, of course, Chopin wrote some of the most beautiful melodies in all of the piano repertoire, but they're partly so beautiful because of how he harmonized them. And a lesser composer would have done much more boring harmonic progressions than Chopin did. Okay, so back to our half steps. It really feels like this whole piece, or at least the first 12 measures, is just very heavy and it's pulling on your heartstrings. That movement down by half steps is the most pathetic musical device I think that you can come up with. This happens, again, back in Bach. Um, lots of things where you have this downward motion by half steps is just something that we automatically feel as sad or grieving or any other word you want to use in that vein. Then we get to measure 13 and we restart it again. It's still pulling down, but it does bring us to this big climax with that part I was just talking about with the four note chord. And then it's like it tries to come back up. Oh, try again with a appoggiatura even. Reaching up again, pulling down by those half steps, Ugh. and that chord right there is like the best thing you could have possibly put there. It functions almost like an augmented six chord, it's not really written that way, but you could think of those um, going to the dominant. So that up from the B flat and G going to the B and the F sharp. Of course Chopin makes it even greater because he gives you a sus chord in there. And of course we should be working on voicing with our students. What notes do you want to bring out? Do you want to hear that lowest bass note? Um, I would say work on that with your student, you know, have them listening for what they want to hear, decide which notes are the most important, but really at the intermediate level, we don't wanna beat a dead horse too much with that and kill their love for this piece. I think there are some other things I'd rather tackle in here than doing too much work with voicing of individual notes. Um, that's a very, very sophisticated 
technique and something that can be tackled again in a more advanced piece. Okay, so the the thing that we really want to work on here that I would advocate for would be feeling these long right hand lines and how are we going to do that on a percussion instrument because as we know, and I've said in many videos, as soon as you play a note on the piano, the sound immediately starts to decay. We cannot use a bow like a violinist can to continue the sound or air like a singer or a wind instrument player can to crescendo through a note or at least continue the sound. So the secret sauce here is simply using your left hand. If you play the downbeat um, with a nice, you know, solid sound and then immediately diminuendo to the next chord. So the first chord, measure one, the second one's gonna be a little softer. And then you can crescendo, again, dip down. Or you can diminuendo through the whole measure, whatever it is, but you're gonna use that left hand to support the right hand and see if you can fool your audience's ears that it's actually moving forward in dynamic. in that as well. If you just play this absolutely steady, it's going to sound completely dead. To that point, we don't want to play the left hand too loudly because we want to balance all those notes that the left hand plays with the one singular note that the right hand is playing. So work with your student on not coming off of the keys, but just sitting right there and just letting a little bit of weight drop the keys down into the key bed. We're not gonna use finger motion, no grasping of the fingers, just sitting there on the key and letting a tiny bit of weight from the forearm play those notes should allow you to get a nice, a nice soft sound. And then one last note about pedal in this piece. Um, it's very dangerous to use Chopin's pedal markings only when studying his music for two reasons. First of all, he just didn't give us a lot of markings, so for, for instance, at the beginning of this piece, it says con pedale with pedal, and then he doesn't tell you anything else except for two markings towards the end of the piece where he wants you to hold the bass note while you come up there. Um, so it's not very clear exactly what he wanted because he assumed that you would do it on your own. The second reason why Chopin's markings can be difficult is that his pedal was, his piano was so different than our modern grand piano. Um, and, and so if you go play these French pianos of the earlier 19th century, it's just a very, very different experience with the pedal. So this is an opportunity for a teacher to train a student in really listening, changing the pedal harmonically for sure. And then you could experiment with some more sophisticated techniques such as only half pedaling or half clearing. Um, but the primary goal at this level would be to engage your student in listening to their pedal and making their own evaluations of is it clear and yet is it connected enough. I hope that gives you some ideas on how to teach the Chopin E minor prelude. If you have any questions, please reach out. Um, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the little like button down there so that more teachers can find my material. Best wishes in all your teaching.